Uh, what allows Lily to see the people around her with such knowledge and precision and clarity is this insider-outsider status that I think you can feel even in this description. And in fact, that insider-outsider status is the central conflict of Lily's character. She is of the world, of her social milieu, but not able to lose herself in it completely. And you can hear that in this tiny description. In fact, you can hear it in every line of the book. And the novel is basically about how that conflict in her own character defines her and ultimately proves her undoing. Those of you who have read The House of Mirth know that every aspect of this two-way characterization will come home to roost. In the course of the novel, Lily's status will completely change and she will feel the brunt of Bertha Dorset's volatility, which she has described in this um, initial description in this kind of warm and colorful way. So the elements of the description are not just fun and colorful and revealing of the object and the observer, but they're also completely significant. There's nothing extraneous here. Everything that is laid out gets used later. It's like a table setting with all of the elements that will be needed in the meal. Um, and nothing is stable or consistent about the world that Wharton describes. This is true even in her treatment of the most minor characters. And I'm going to give you one example, um, that of Jack Stepney, Lily's cousin, and Gwen Van Osburgh, um, his, uh, the, the woman he's courting. We see them only peripherally ever in the book. Uh, they're the kinds of characters who could easily have remained static in a lesser fiction and you probably would have. But again, in Wharton's work, nothing is wasted. So I'm just gonna read our very first um, introduction to the two of them. Lily is at a um, house party and Jack is there too, her, her cousin. She was roused from her musings by the approach of her cousin, Jack Stepney, who, at Gwen Van Osburgh's side, was returning across the garden from the tennis court. The couple in question were engaged in the same kind of romance in which Lily figured, she's chasing a guy with money, and the latter felt a certain annoyance in contemplating what seemed to her a caricature of her own situation. Miss Van Osburgh was a large girl with flat surfaces and no highlights. <laughs> Jack Stepney had once sent a set of her that she was as reliable as roast mutton. His own taste was in the line of less solid and a more highly seasoned diet, but hunger makes any fare palatable, and there had been times when Mr. Stephanie had been reduced to a crust. Um, Lily considered with interest the expression of their faces. The girls turned toward her companions like an empty plate held up to be filled, while the man lounging at her side already betrayed the encroaching boredom, which would presently crack the thin veneer of his smile. So um, there are clearly established roles here, both in terms of the couple's relationship to each other, the, mem the members of the couple's relationship to each other, and also their relation to Lily. She and her cousin are portrayed as being alike in terms of exotic tastes, um, which have a strong conflict with their need for money. And there's a kind of kinship um, between them. And this, there, uh, just a couple of pages later, there's a kind of, there's an additional little description. Um, Lily's looking around the table at dinner, and here's her, this is a long sentence in which she observes a lot of people, and here's what she says about Jack. Jack Stepney, with his confident smile and anxious eyes, uh, halfway between the sheriff and an heiress, Gwen Van Osburgh, with all the guileless confidence of a young girl who has always been told that there is no one richer than her father. <laughs> so then they, Gwen and Jack marry. Lily doesn't marry the guy that she was chasing and she remains single. Um, and after, sometime after the wedding, this is, this is uh, a good hundred pages later, um, Lily, uh, puts on, sort of creates a bit of a, a spectacle of herself at a party by posing as a, um, a woman in a painting, and a, 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 someone from Greek mythology, and wearing a sort of risque dress, and everyone was excited and sort of thrilled by it. And uh, someone asks about where she is, and um, Jack Stephanie answers, Lily? Oh, someone else answers, sorry. Lily, she's just gone. She had to run off. I forgot where. Wasn't she wonderful last night? 
Who's that, Lily? Asked Jack Stephanie from the depths of a neighboring armchair. Really, you know, I'm no prude, but when it comes to a girl standing there as if she was up at auction, I thought seriously about speaking to Cousin Julia. You didn't know Jack had become our social censor, Mrs. Fisher said to Selden with a laugh, and Stephanie spluttered amid the general derision. But she's a cousin, hang it, and when a man's married, town talk was full of her this morning. So he seems, he seems to have shifted a little bit from the kind of rakish figure that he, that he cut initially into someone who's suddenly concerned about convention. Then, uh, another 40 pages later, we encounter um, him in Europe uh, with his wife. Steph Stephanie, since his marriage, had thickened and grown prudish. This is some months later as the Van Osburgh husbands were apt to do, but his wife, to his surprise and discomfiture, had developed an earth-shaking fastness of gait, which left him trailing breathlessly in her wake. <laughs> That's where we'll go then, she declared with a heavy toss of her plumage. I'm so tired of the terrace, it's as dull as one of mother's dinners. And Lord Hubert has promised to tell us who, who all the awful people are at the other place. Hasn't he, Carrie? Now, Jack, don't look so solemn. <coughs> so, a, a, you know, a rather large shift at that point in their roles. And then finally, Jack plays a kind of important part in Lily's um, undoing, which is that she's, in trying to protect someone else, actually Bertha Dorset from the initial description, she's been caught in a sort of compromising position and she needs someone to basically cover for her and her friend brings her to her cousin, Jack Stepney. This, they're on their way here. In the cab, they continued to remain silent through the brief drive which carried them to the illuminated portals of the Stepneys Hotel. Here he left her outside in the darkness of the raised hood while his name was sent up to Stepney. This is her friend doing this. And he packed the showy hall, awaiting the latter's descent. Then, minutes later, the two men passed out together between the gold-laced custodians of the threshold. But in the vestibule, Stephanie, Stephanie drew up with a last flare of reluctance. It's understood then, he stipulated nervously with his hand on Selden's arm. She leaves tomorrow by the early train and my wife's asleep and can't be disturbed. So he's basically become a gatekeeper for his wife and completely shifted in, in every way. It would have been so easy to leave these characters in a, sta in a state of stasis or to let their story be a playing out of their characters um, Jack skirt chasing after the marriage, Gwen becoming duller and more solid with age. But instead, Wharton tells us a mini story of their courtship and marriage in which in some sense their roles are reversed. And she does this with pretty much every peripheral character in the novel. And when you add all of that up, the, the overall power of the work is exponentially increased. Another thing I think about a lot in terms of characterization and a term I used a lot with my students last semester was history. Every word you choose in describing someone tells us a great deal about their past and present states, ideally more than one thing at a time. This is how we achieve the compression that I was talking about earlier, because so much of what the reader needs to know about a character can be said indirectly through suggestion and inference. This is especially important when dealing with a first-person narrator who may not be inclined toward self-revelation. And it's that kind of almost unconscious delivery of information that allows the writer to avoid long passages of exposition. Another thing I really try to stay away from if I can. So I'm going to read you um, the first paragraph of Jean Reese's novel, Good Morning Midnight. This contains 111 words, and I, I, it delivers up a tremendous amount of information, which the reader probably isn't totally conscious of because we're just starting a novel and trying to find our bearings. But, but in fact, the information is being delivered, and, and subtly, um, the reader is being strongly located in the mind of a particular person. So this is Good Morning Midnight, published in 1938. Quite like old times, the room says, yes, no. There are two big beds, I'm sorry, there are two beds, a big one for Madame and a smaller one on the opposite side for Monsieur. The wash basin is cut off by a curtain. It is a large room, the smell of cheap hotels, faint, almost imperceptible. 
The street outside is narrow, cobblestoned, going sharply uphill and ending in a flight of steps, what they call an impasse. I have been here five days. I have decided on a place to eat at midday, a place to eat in at night, a place to have my drink after dinner. I have arranged my little life. So 111 words, what do we know? And, and really almost nothing said directly here. Um, we know that the narrator is probably a woman because the, the bed from Madame is mentioned before Monsieur. We know that she's probably middle-aged because it is Madame and not Mademoiselle. We know that she's low on money because it's a cheap hotel, she says that. Uh, we also know that she was once in better circumstances because no one who's only stayed in cheap hotels notices that they smell like cheap hotels. <laughs> We know that she's not just alone, but lonely, probably, because she's imagining herself in conversation with a room. And we also can probably guess that she's used to being lonely, because there's no sense of an occasion or anything new here. There isn't a sense that this day is different from other days. And she also comes across as somewhat homeless or disconnected. She's clearly arrived in a new place, but there's no mention of visiting anyone. And even when she lays out the way that she's um, spending her days, there's no mention of another person. So we, we know quite a bit about her, actually. We can also make some pretty good guesses about her habits of mind. And that's another term that I actually do think about, unlike, um, you know, characterization, for example, um, because after contradiction, which I would say is for me the most important aspect of characterization, habits of mind is the next most important one. And by that I mean, what are the mental tricks a particular person uses to organize the world and make it familiar to him or herself? It's one of the most defining aspects of a person, and they're completely different for everyone. Um, so what can we know about this narrator's habits of mind? Well, she looks for and names the failure around her. So whereas a lot of people tend to try to see the positive or find a way to um, you know, spin something into seeming better than it is, she's someone who comes right out and says, the smell of cheap hotels faint, almost imperceptible. We also know that she projects her inner state onto the landscape because of that uh, description, you know, what they call an impasse, which is the end of a paragraph and kind of hangs there suggestively. Um, and yet, she's not given to self-pity at all because she follows that with a, a very um, a kind of logistical look at her daily plan. Um, there's a sense that she knows herself well and, and in a way watches herself from a distance. So all of that gives a feeling of a kind of acceptance of failure, but an unwillingness to give up completely. There's no sense of, um, there's no sense of, of drama or even self-dramatization here. There's a sense of a person who understands that she's in a bad spot and is going on nonetheless with a certain irony and a certain humor even. And she's self-deprecating. I have arranged my little life. So all of that taken together suggests really an existential state. This is a person who's at the end of the line, knows it, and is going on with a dry combination of humor and despair. Now, I've read the book, so it's easy for me to, to see all of this there, and I'm not expecting that you listen to this, you know, knowing all of this. In fact, I think part of the power of it is that the reader doesn't consciously know what information the reader is receiving. But I, I think it's all there in the writing. And again, as in the case of Wharton, it lays out, um, it, it lays a setting that, that Reese uses very economically and thoroughly in the course of the novel.